This is London, the most exciting city in Europe. We love the vibe, the opportunities, the diversity, the stimulation. But it comes at a price. Nearly 10,000 Londoners die every year of health conditions caused by inhaling air full of microscopic particles of soot originating from diesel engine exhaust. So filthy is London's air that it prompted the European Commission to threaten legal action after one of the city's streets breached annual limits for nitrogen oxides only five days into 2017. And this is me. On my daily commute to central London, via some air pollution hotspots such as Finsbury Park and Farringdon Road. I was hoping to do something for my health, but is this morning workout really good for me? I will soon find out. This is the monitor that you're going to wear uh, this week. Uh, this measures black carbon, which is a component of PM2.5. Uh, fine particles mm -hmm. that you'll be exposed to through your journey when you're cycling in. If you could also wear this uh, GPS watch, that'll allow us to say, right, at this time, this is what the concentration was, and then a few minutes later, you were over here, and this is what the concentration was, and that'll allow us to build up a picture of your commute through the week. After your first week, um, we'll have a look at your data, we'll download it, have a look, see if we can see some interesting points, um, and then we'll have a think about how we can maybe change your route for the second week. I am one of eight volunteers in a King's College study assessing individuals' exposure to air pollution. Each of us uses a different mode of transport to commute to and from work. I am the only cyclist in a group. Another person rides a motorbike. The rest use a combination of buses, underground and overground trains and walking. So in this study we're focusing on, on people's exposure to air pollution particularly during your commute because that's something that you have to do but for most people that commute will be the biggest kind of exposure that they have during the day. If we can find a way to reduce their exposure even by a little bit then that will have a beneficial effect in the longer term for them. Air quality networks regularly measure particles that are less than 10 and 2.5 micrometers in size. However, there is also a category called the ultrafine particles, which are less than 100 nanometers, and these are understood much less, even though they might be the most dangerous for human health. The tinier the particles, the deeper they penetrate into the lungs, where they cause inflammation, worsen symptoms of allergies and asthma, and increase the risk of lung cancer. The body can get rid of some particles, but others stay in the lungs for the long haul. And the lungs are likely not the only body's dump site for air pollution particles. We are now going to visit Professor Barbara Marr from the University of Lancaster to talk about the shocking discovery she and her team made last year. Professor Marr studied a particular type of air pollution that is magnetic. She wanted to know whether these particles could make their way into the most important human organ, the brain. In urban air pollution, there are many, many particles of magnetite that form part of the air pollution mix. And many of those are nanoparticle in size, anything between 5 and 350 nanometers in size. And so the, the abundance of them in, in the atmosphere and the very small size of those particles it seems to me likely that they may be able to gain entry to the human brain. Magnetite is known to be toxic to human brain cells. Professor Marr knew that high concentrations of magnetite had previously been found in brains of Alzheimer's disease sufferers. However, medical researchers believe the magnetite to be made inside the brain, as a result of the body's chemistry going awry. But Marr thought that such tiny particles could be inhaled into the brain through the nose and the olfactory bulb, where there is no barrier protecting the brain. To test the assumption, she ordered two sets of brains, one from the Manchester Brain Bank and one from Mexico City that has been struggling with extreme air pollution for years. When she and her colleagues sliced the brains and put them into their magnetometers and under high-resolution transmission electron microscopes, they found much more magnetite than they expected. In the human brain tissues that we looked at, there were two types of magnetite particle. 
So there were these very geometric angular particles that looked very much like particles that form inside the brain. But the other particles were very different. They were rounded, many of them, and they varied in size from 5 to 150 nanometers. Um, they often occurred in association with other metals that we wouldn't normally expect to find in abundance in the brain, such as platinum and nickel and copper. The shape, composition, as well as the size distribution of those particles all looked compellingly similar to the magnetite found in the atmosphere. For one of the crystalline, naturally formed particles, they're of the order of a hundred of the pollution particles in the brain. So in terms of total numbers, for a gram of brain tissue, you would find millions of these pollution source particles in the tissues. Professor Marr says there is no way the spherical particles could have been formed in the brains naturally. They have been created at temperatures of several hundred degrees centigrade. They are essentially molten droplets of metal emitted from combustion engines and released in friction during braking. It's time to get the results of the first week of my experiment. Professor Marr's findings got me seriously concerned about the magnetic properties of my brain and I'm worried whether my choice to cycle in London puts me at extra risk. You can see your journeys very clearly um, on this data. Commutes are, are basically all of your exposure during the day. Um, when you're at home, there's hardly any, so that's kind of like one or two micrograms maybe. There's quite a big peak on this journey in on Thursday um, of 36 micrograms. Uh, I'm just a bit confused. I understand that these are my kind of journeys to work when I'm cycling, but I'm really confused because this peak here and this peak here looks much bigger. Oh yeah, so this is your weekend. This is Saturday uh, and this is Sunday. Looks like you're quite active um, on those two days. Well, I remember on Saturday I actually went to central London to meet uh, with a friend and I didn't cycle actually on the day. I remember I took a tube. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, I mean, there's, there's more black carbon on the tube um, and obviously there's not much ventilation on the tube so it gets quite, quite dusty. Almost all of your exposure is your journeys. If we can reduce that by a little bit mm -hmm. for week two, then that's Hopefully, over time, that's going to have a, a benefit for you. Fantastic. <laughs> for the second week of the experiment, I will try to reduce my exposure by using a different route. It will be almost 10 minutes longer, but avoiding most busy roads and intersections. In a city like London, combustion engines in cars, buses and lorries are responsible for about 40% of the air pollution. The health-conscious public is therefore increasingly calling for the most polluting technology to be phased out in favor of other, cleaner propulsion systems. But what is the truth about diesel? We are going to the University of Bath to find out. If you looked at exhaust emissions in the late 1980s, early 90s, you'd have seen traces of lead, you'd have seen large amounts of carbon monoxide, unburnt hydrocarbons and oxides of nitrogen. If you look today, you'll see much less of all of those things. You've reached the point where we have mechanisms to deal with all of the serious uh, pollutants in both gasoline and diesel today, whereas in the 1980s we had no mechanisms for any of the things that we were concerned about. Why then, despite the technological progress, is diesel in particular getting all the bad publicity? Once promoted as the cleaner alternative to petrol due to its better carbon footprint, diesel is now being pointed at as the number one cause of the air pollution health crisis. Well, we have much uh, greater numbers of diesel engines than we did 20 years ago because they're more efficient and they produce less CO2, which is still really important. One of the reasons that diesel engines are more efficient is because they throttle the air going into the engine less than a petrol engine would that means there's more oxygen present in the exhaust. And if you have oxygen in the exhaust, it's very difficult to do the reduction chemistry that you need to in order to remove oxides and nitrogen from the exhaust system. Challenges with removing nitrogen oxides from the exhaust infamously prompted Volkswagen to start installing devices into its diesel vehicles that allow cheating in emissions tests. The scandal has shaken up the industry, but Professor Brace says that technologically, the problem has been solved. Well, this is a, an exhaust system from a Euro 6 standard car, the latest emission standard. Along the centre of the vehicle, you can see the exhaust system that's going from the engine at the front out to the tailpipe at the back. Uh, what you can't see is under the cover, there is a, 
a particulate filter and uh, an oxidation catalyst really close to the engine. Then the exhaust comes out of that system and it gets through to here. You can see there there's a urea injector which puts urea into the exhaust stream which allows the reduction chemistry to work. And then later on there's the uh, catalyst units that actually do the, the reduction chemistry and allow the oxides of nitrogen to be pr reduced into harmless components. The speed of innovation is faster than the pace at which people are buying new cars. Diesel vehicles manufactured after 2009 have particulate matter filters that remove all particles from the exhaust larger than 20 nanometers. But older vehicles without such technology are not a rare sight. The same goes for the nitrogen oxides, which only had to be dealt with in 2015. I'm going to get my week two results and I'm really curious to see what are the extra 10 minutes that I had to add to my journey every day to avoid the most polluted uh, places has actually made any difference to my exposure. This is your week two data along the bottom here. This is your week one data. I've kind of averaged your morning commutes in week one and your evening commutes in week two. Now, what I've also done is, in order to make it a fairer comparison, because it could be that week one was more polluted, was more still, and it could be that week two was windy and raining, I've taken what we call background concentrations from a monitor which is in North Kensington, and I've removed that from your data. So we kind of remove the effect of, of weather which just leaves us with your increment above what the background was. And the good news is um, that your morning commutes in week two were on average about 36% lower than your morning commutes in week one, and your evening commutes on week two were about 25% lower than your evening commutes in week one. So what do you do? You can move out of the city, buy a face mask, or try the same thing that I've been trying as part of the King's College experiment. I am feeling positively empowered. Air pollution reduces lifespan. Now I know I can add some extra years to my life by carefully choosing the routes I take. Every Londoner can do the same. A previous King's College study found that people walking between the Euston and King's Cross stations can reduce their exposure to particulate matter by up to 70% by taking a back road instead of the extremely polluted Euston road. And the good news is that if you walk or cycle, you're always better off than in a car or in a bus.